Case number two is a 30-year-old female with a stomach nodule. Yeah, that was actually the difficult one. Uh -huh. It made me think a lot. So uh, it's... I think here it's we got like muscularis out here, right? Yeah, it's like a... Uh, yeah, and then it's like a vascular tumor, you know, and then it has like a kind of cubital cells proliferating around it. And like some of them have like a perimeter halo around it. Okay, let's go in closer and look here. There yeah. are a lot of dilated vessels. You are right about that. And there are these very round or cuboidal, if you yeah. like that terminology, um, cells kind of around those vessels. Yeah. Do you think that those are endothelial derived cells, like a true I vascular? I thought about like a glomus tumor ah. at the beginning. You know. Well, that's very good because that's what it is. It oh, is a glomus okay. tumor. <laughs> not as difficult as you thought when you got it right. <laughs> Yeah, and so these look vascularized, but they're not truly vascular neoplasms, yeah. right? They're not neoplasms of endothelial cells. And you can kind of see that when you look closer, you can see that these are endothelial cells in here, but the tumor cells are separate, like they're out around the outside of the vessels. Yeah. So sometimes that can be a helpful trick when you see a very hypervascular tumor with lots of vessels, and you wonder, is it, you know, angiosarcoma, or hermangioendothelium, something like that. When you look close and see, oh, the endothelial cells are definitely distinct and separate from the neoplastic cells, that can help you sort out, oh, it's not really a vascular neoplasm. It's a neoplasm that has a lot of vessels in it. And I've seen practicing pathologists really struggle with that and, and get it wrong, and it can make a big difference. So these are actually tumors of what kind of cells are glomus cells, do you know? Like, uh, I think Perivascular. Yeah, they're pericytes, right? They're perivascular muscle, modified muscle cells called pericytes. That's the, the type of, uh, of cell that the glomus cells are recapitulating. And of course, they're named for these little uh, glomus apparatus that are usually out under the nail bed and the fingertips, or also known as the canal of Suke and Hoyer. And anyone out there who speaks French, I apologize because I'm sure I'm I'm terribly pronouncing those names, but they're little arteria venous and astomoses. But we can see glomus, obviously the nail bed is a good site for glomus, but you can actually see them anywhere in the body. Internally, when they involve the internal organs, the stomach seems to be, I think, the most common site, if I recall. Um, certainly it's a well-described site, and it's important because think of the other tumors that occur in the wall of the stomach, things like gist and, and stuff like that. So you wanna make sure you don't confuse this because uh, the significance is different. So like you said, the cells are very round and monotonous. They wrap and circle around the vessels. They kind of make a layered appearance that some people like to say onion skin. I think onion skin is highly overused in pathology, so I try to avoid it because everything says, oh, this and that is onion skin. And I just feel like it's a little overdone. But I do think it is helpful that the cells do tend to run in these like kind of rows, though. So whether you call it onion skinning or whatever, the cells wrap around vessels and they do tend to kind of have an organization or a pattern to them that's kind of parallel. And I like your point about that they have halos. You don't always see that, but seeing some degree of pale or clear cytoplasmic change is pretty good for glomus. Um, and uh, that can be really helpful. And sometimes it can be prominent and really trick you, make you think it's an epithelial tumor. Like in the skin, they can look a lot like skin and nexal tumors. I've seen cases with a lot of uh, clear cell change that, you know, we're, we're really tempting to think, oh, maybe it's a hydradenoma or por poroid uh, type of tumor. And in fact, it was a glomus. And then also they tend to have a lot of edema or even myxoid change in between the nest of cells. That, that's not always there, but a lot of times you'll see the cells kind of floating around in this background. So, um, okay, cool. So the, this is a big one. And you know, in the skin and soft tissue, if we see a really big or deep glomus, we get worried that it might be an actual malignant glomus. But in the stomach, the rules that we use elsewhere for benign and malignant don't seem to kind of apply the same way. This is still an area that's not fully fleshed out, but I remember uh, Chris Fletcher gave a course once and he was talking about that, that if I recall, and I hope I'm not misquoting him, I'm sure someone will point it out if I am, but then he said that the majority of these seem to behave indolently, um, even though they're large and deep. And so they're, you know, in the, in the periphery, like in the leg or the arm or something, we would worry about a big, deep glomus. But in the stomach, it doesn't seem that they act badly. So anyway, really, really nice example of a gastric glomus tumor. These are perivascular cells, but they're not endothelial. So they're going to be negative for CD31, ERG, and CD34 usually. And what they'll express is actin, smooth muscle oh. actin, because they're pericytes, they're modified smooth muscle. Usually they're Desmond negative, but they, they stain with actin. 
Although in my experience, the actin is not always diffusely strongly positive. It can be kind of patchy. The other thing that I've noticed um, that you can use sometimes, you don't usually need it, is let's see if we can get it in better focus here. Hold on, let me find a good area. The individual cells, oh there, perfect. Look at these guys. The individual cells are wrapped by a layer of basement membrane. You can very distinctly see the outline of each single individual glomus cell. That's really characteristic of this tumor. So if you do a, like a collagen 4 basement membrane stain, uh, like an immunostain, or even a PAS, it can really light up the wrapping of, of, of basement membrane around each cell. Another tumor that does that is epithelioid schwannoma. You can see individual cells wrapped with basement membrane. I don't know if that's really important. It's very pretty, though, just so you know. So in any case, that's a, a kind of a cool and unique feature of, of glomus uh, tumor. So very nice. These are just such fascinating tumors. And one other little trick that Dr. Weiss taught me about glomus tumors, and I really like, is she said, you know, when you see the nodule of a glomus, if you go out to the periphery of the glomus tumor, often you'll see this. You'll see glomus cells tracking along around additional vessels that are branched out of way. They like to wrap and follow the vessels. So even if you go to the edge, you can often see the glomus cells trickling along and following other vessels around out at the side of the tumor. Like, look, right there. Right there. It's leaving that little nodule. It doesn't always do this, but when it does, it's quite satisfying. And it wants to follow this little vessel. It just, the cells know they're supposed to stick along a vessel. So that's kind of cool. And I've certainly had a couple times where that actually helped me in a challenging case of, it was actually a malignant glomus, but seeing an area like that at the edge is what made me think, oh, could this be glomus? And sure enough, with stains, it was. So that is glomus tumor of the stomach wall in this case. Really nice example. Oh yeah, here for anyone who wanted to see, there's, there's our mucosa. So if you're into GI path now, you've seen something other than soft tissue. Okay, now that's enough of that. Back to soft tissue. 